Give the Lord a great big shout here this morning. Amen. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You're welcome here, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. You are worthy to be praised, man. We praise you on this day and we glorify you, Lord. Right now, Lord, we come before you this morning, Lord God, and we give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory, Lord God. Holy Spirit, you are more than welcome here. We open up our hearts and we invite the very presence of God to be in this place, to be in our hearts, to be in our lives, to have control of each and every single one of us, our voices, our hearts, our actions. And right now, Lord, we thank Thank you, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Give the Lord a great big shout this morning. Praise God. We're going to let the kids go off to class. Amen. And uh, everybody may be seated this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. How's everybody doing today? Blessed. Amen. Hallelujah. Hey man, we're going to do something a little bit different here this morning. It's not going to be your typical Sunday morning service. Hey Amen. Uh, but I want to, I just want to talk to you today. And what I want to talk to you today about is I want to talk to you about prayer. And I want to give you scripture and I want to give you insight and I want to show you the importance of prayer in our lives and how it's something that God has left for us and that he's instructed us. Why? For our benefit and for, you know, and, and to glorify him. And so that way he can help us. But, you know, I want to tell you that, you know, there is not no formula to follow. You know, a lot of people, they go through the rituals, you know what I mean? They go through all kinds of stuff, you know what I mean? And, and we could see it all over. And what that is, is religion. I want you to understand that that's religion and it's not relationship. And he wants us to have a relationship with him. But God's word is very clear that certain things must line up for our prayers to be answered. You know, there's things in our life, they have to line up with what God's word says. You know, and, and a lot of people, they don't teach about prayer. You know, they'll expect you to pray. You know, they'll expect, well, this is, you know, this is what Christians do. Oh, yeah? Well, cool. All right. Well, well how do you do it? You know, because a lot of us, we don't know how to pray. You know, and, and sometimes we make prayer so complicated. Now, we make prayer complicated. Like we have to come up with some big words or we have to try to act out holy when we pray to get God's attention. You know, there was a movie, it was called, um, man, what was it called? Pet Detective. Long time ago, some of you younger guys don't even know what I'm talking about, but there was this guy, Ace Ventura, the Pet Detective, amen. And I remember that he, he did this one thing, you know, he was messing with these religious folks, and they were, they were Buddhist, and he walked out there because, you know, they were all religious. And he looked at them, and he was like, all righty then. You know what I mean? And, and we come to the Lord like that. You know what I mean? Like, man, come on. You know, we're, we're a bunch of filthy rags, church. You know what? I don't know about you, but you know what I mean? I'm beat up from the feet up. I'm messed up from the neck up. You know what? I'm busted and disgusted. But you know what? I know the only person that I could put my trust in. And that is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. And I, and I love what God is doing. Because he wants us to pay attention. He wants us to pay attention to what he's trying to tell us. You know, some people love to pray while others are scared to pray. Man, some people love to pray and some people just are scared to pray. You know, and you see, you know, a lot of the older people like to pray. There's some younger people that like to pray, but you know what I mean? Not really. You know, not even, you know, people my age don't even like to pray. You know, and it's hard. And then some people are just too scared to pray. Because they get to thinking, oh, what if this happens? Or what if this? What, you know what I mean? And, and they really start thinking. Because some, somewhere down the line, somebody told them, you better watch what you ask for. You better watch it. So, oh, oh, no, no, no. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to say nothing. I'm not going to do this. But the reason why is because they feel like they don't know how to do it right. That's why they're scared to pray. Because they don't feel like they know how to do it right. I know so many people that will stray away from prayer 
just because, you know what I mean, they don't feel like they're worthy enough. They're like, you know what I mean, like God's not going to hear them, which is so untrue. But after today's message, if you feel this way, I believe you will never feel this way again. Man, God is so good. And I want you to understand something. God has been waking me up. And I have not been able to sleep. This has been going on since, since Thursday. And Thursday, you know what I mean? I, and the first thing that I did that I haven't done in, in such a long time was I immediately went into prayer. You know, there were so many other things that I could have did. I could have woke up and, you know, I mean, I was up, but I could have got up and went upstairs and turned on the TV. I could have walked around the house, you know what I mean, and started tinkering around with things because, you know, in my flesh, I feel like I got insomnia. You know what I mean? Like I can't, can't fall asleep, but it's not. It's a spiritual battle. You know, when God woke me up for a reason and, and immediately I began to get in prayer knowing that I had to go to work early in the morning and I'd already been up, you know, all day the day before, you know, because I always get up early. And I was tired, but as soon as I began to pray, God took all that tiredness away from me and he energized me. And I, and I prayed all, all, that, all through that night and I went up and I went to work, but I couldn't stop praying. You know, I was instructing people on what they were supposed to be doing, but immediately after I did that, man, I was praying in my mind and in my heart and in my spirit, and then I would begin praying in tongues. And I'm just sitting there, and people would come ask me questions, and I would hold on. I'd be like, okay, go do that. And then I would begin praying again. And I did that all day long. And then we had a funeral on Friday. And I was praying all day, too, for peace and understanding and compassion. Why? Because how many of you know that we can be in, in a place where we don't fit in and we could put up walls instead of asking God, you know what? Give me compassion, Lord. Give me a heart of your own, Lord God. Help me, Lord God, to understand what's going on around me so that way I can see your plan and your purpose. Why? Because I don't want to be a hindrance. I want to be able to win people over to you. I want people to see you. But if I... I'm in a place where I feel like I don't fit in and I put up a wall. What does that do? It puts up a wall and a barrier for me to witness to somebody else. You know, other of you here today may have given up on prayer. Man. How many of you guys have given up on, you know, on some prayers? Maybe you guys have been praying for something and you guys haven't got an answer and you guys have given up on that prayer. Or you might not pray as often as you should. And I also hope after today that this changes. You know what? I don't know about you, church, but I say look around you right now. Look around you. Look at all these empty chairs. And yes, people may have come and go, but you know what? I'm not worried about that. You know, the only thing that I care about is glorifying God. The only thing I care about is serving God. You know what? In season and out of season, whether things are good, whether things are bad, you know what? I'm going to continue to serve God, but let this be an awareness and attention to us. You know what? That we have something to pray for. You know what? These seats need to be filled up with people who don't know God. You know, we're not telling them to come in here and be perfect and be all holy. You know what? Come in here with your drug addictions. Come in here with your divorced lifestyle. Come in here, you know what I mean, with all that stuff that you've been messed up with. Why? Because God wants to heal you. God wants to change you, but it's going to come through prayer. And see, God's showing us right here. We have something to pray for. I don't know about you, but your loved ones should be sitting next to you. Not your friends. You know what? I don't come to church to make friends. And if you come to church to make friends, then what? You're in the wrong place. Go to a seminar. Go to the rec center. Go to a restaurant. You know what? Go somewhere. But you know what? Go make friends at a bowling alley. Go make friends at the movies. Go make friends at the supermarket. Don't come make friends at the local church. Why? Because we're family here. We make brothers and sisters in the church. We don't make friends in a church. It means more. Why? Because 
You're going to pray earnestly for your family members more than you would pray for a friend. Why? Because they mean more to you. Family means more than friends. You know, when we were kids, it was all so much easier, though, wasn't it? Man, when we were kids, it was easy. I'm going to share something with you on prayer. Even kids know how to pray. Kids. And a lot of kids, they didn't even realize some of the things that they were praying for. But check this out. Some children's prayers. This one's by Debbie when she was seven. No, not, not, not Debbie back there. Sorry. This is a different Debbie. Amen. But this Debbie says, Dear God, please send a new baby for my mommy. The new baby you sent last week cries too much. <laughs> a simple prayer. You know what I mean? And it's innocent. But you know what I mean? She meant it. You know what I mean? She really meant it. It was a heartfelt prayer. You know, another guy named Jimmy, he was only six. He said, dear God, who did, you, who did you make smarter, boys or girls? My sister and I want to know. <laughs> you know, it's innocent little, little prayers. You know what I mean? Man, dear God, why, man, we want to know. You know, another one was Hank. He was only seven. And he said, dear Lord, thank you for the nice day today. You even fooled the TV weatherman. How I many you know that the weatherman's always wrong? You know what I mean? The way, usually always wrong all the time. But you know, those are innocent prayers. One of them says, Dear God, I need a raise in my allowance. Could you have one of your angels tell my father? Thank you. <laughs> man, you know, kids, are, they're on it, man. Jeez, man, they want all the newest and latest gadgets out there. You know, there was another one. He said, Dear God, this is my prayer. Could you please give my brother some brains? So far, he doesn't have any. <laughs> Simple little innocent prayers, you know what I mean? And, and a lot of us, you know what I mean? It takes time for us to think about what we're going to say to God. Man, why is it that we have to think about what we're going to say to God, you know what I mean? And, and a lot of times, you know, we don't realize that there's not enough that we couldn't say to God. Man, there's so much, man. Just waking up in the morning. Just being able to open your eyes and see color, to see other people. Why? Because there's people out there that are blind. Just to be able to hear noises, just to be able to touch, just to be able to, you know, to feel, just to be able to smell, to taste, to walk. You know what I mean? Just all these things that we're able to do that we take for granted and we don't thank God for. You know what? Thank you for my marriage. Thank you for my kids. Thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. You know what? Thank you for my employment. Lord, thank you for my health. You know, we focus on the, all the stuff that could be going on. A doctor could tell us something, and we'll focus on that one bad little thing that he says instead of focusing on all the other stuff. And say, you know what, Lord? Thank you for my health. Because even though one little minute thing might not be right, everything else is good. Why? Because I'm still going. There's changes I need to make, and you bring them out to me, Lord, but thank you. Thank you for my life. Why? And it should never go by unnoticed. You know, have you ever prayed and the outcome wasn't what you expected? Oh, man. Lord, save my marriage. And you go through a divorce anyways. It wasn't the outcome you expected, right? Oh, God wasn't listening to me. That's not true. That's not what the Bible says. You know, today, church, I want to share a few things with you that the Bible teaches us on prayer. Now, that being said, God is sovereign, and he does whatever he likes. I want you to understand that there's no magical remedy or anything like that, but I'm going to give you scripture to help you along the way in your walk with the Lord. Amen? But today, we're going to look at this, at this condition of our prayer lives. Perhaps there's a reason that one or maybe all of our prayers aren't being answered. How many of you have been praying and it seems like there's just no answer? My Lord! I don't have no answers. What's going on? And you keep praying and you keep praying. Are you ready, church? Let's get started because we have a lot to cover here. We might be here till 2 o'clock. <laughs> Have you ever wondered why we say, in Jesus' name, 
at the end of a prayer? Huh? Have you ever wondered that? Or are you just dead just because everybody, that's just something that, that we do, you know? Everybody else does it. Everybody other Christian, that's how every other Christian prayed from the beginning since I've been a Christian, you know what I mean? And that's just what you do as a Christian. When you pray, you say, in the name of Jesus. Oh, wow, okay, well, go with me to John. Chapter 14, verses 13 through 14. And we'll go in the Amplified. He goes, he goes, it goes 13 and 14. Or is that both of them together? Okay. And I will do, and I myself will grant whatever you ask in my name as presenting all that I am so that the Father may be glorified and extolled in through the Son. Yes, I will grant, I myself will do for you whatever you shall ask in my name as presenting all that I am. I hope that this was pretty clear. When we pray, we are to pray to Jesus Christ and that we should not be afraid to ask him for anything. You know, there's only one person that we should be praying to and that's Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ intercedes to the Father on our behalf and that's why you say, he says, in the name of Jesus. See, a lot of times, you know, I had an experience and, you know, I mean, I, my dad is a Catholic you know what I mean? And I have a lot of Catholic family members, you know what I mean? And uh, I'm not here to, to, to talk bad about the Catholics. I'm not here to talk bad about any of them, you know what I mean? But what I'm here to say is, you know what I mean? Scripture, the same Bible that we read is the same Bible that they read. They have a few other books, you know, they got the Maccabees, but whatever, you know what I mean? It's still the same Bible from beginning to end, you know what I mean? And it's the very same word, but yet they say, Hail Mary. They pray to Mary, and they don't pray to Jesus. That's right. That's right. They don't pray to Jesus. They pray to the Virgin Mary, yes, they do. not to Jesus. And he says here, pray in the name of Jesus. You know what I mean? And there are a lot of other religions that, that, that do. Buddha, Muhammad, you know what I mean? There's all kinds of different religions. And remember what I said? I said religion. Yeah. I want you to understand. I'm not, you know, we're, it's about a relationship and not about religion. But see, and he says to pray in the name of Jesus. And that's what he means. You know what? Don't, don't, don't put any other name out. Don't pray to nobody else. Don't ask nobody else. You know what? Ask me and come to me. And he says he will give you the answer. He says, I want you to understand something here. When we do that, we should not be afraid to ask him for anything. You shouldn't be afraid to ask Jesus for anything. Why? Because if you're asking him, guess what? He's going to answer for you. Now I want you to go with me to John chapter 15, verse 7. Now this scripture right here reminds me of a relationship with my daughters. It says, if you live in me, abide vitally united to me, and my words remain in you and continue to live in your hearts, ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. And the reason why I said I related this to my daughters is because I want to bring this scripture to life to you right here. Check this out. You know, Scripture reminds me of my, it reminds me of my relationship with my daughters. You know, um, as we're parents and we can relate to where we are, where, where Christ is coming from. Aren't you more likely to give your children stuff when they're obeying you? When they're showing you how much they love you? Aren't you? What's the biggest saying? I remember figuring this out as a little kid. And a few days before the newest little gadget or toy came out or something that I wanted, guess what? You got anything for me to do? I was on my best behavior. I followed all the rules. I did whatever I had to do to get what I needed, right? Because it was new and I got it. I knew how to play the system. <laughs> but does anybody know what I'm talking about here? I bet you parents know what I'm talking about, huh? You already know. You already know. Man, then my mom would say, what is it that you want anyways? She already knew. What do you want? Because why? Because you're acting weird. You don't act nice. You're evil. <laughs> you're an evil little kid. <laughs> no, I was, I was, I was, I was, I wasn't, a, I wasn't a very good little kid. You know, I was a good kid, but I wasn't a good kid. You know what I mean? I was, I was out there. But when I wanted something, I knew how to be on my best behavior. 
How many of you guys, when you want something, you know how to be on your best behavior? Eee, praise God. See, honesty goes a long way. Praise the Lord. You know, you'll do it at work. You'll show up on the job site early, 15 minutes early, you know what I mean? You'll throw yourself, go above and beyond and do all this stuff and do all these things when you don't have to. I say, what is it that you want? You know, they already know. They know what you're after, but see, in, in the world, it's different than it is with our children. In the world, you know what I mean? They're, already, they're trying to hold you back. They're like, look at this guy coming out here, man, trying to learn all these things and all this stuff. You know what? No, 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 no. Put him out there, get him the shovel. Why? Because I don't want him to take my job. <laughs> and that's it. instead of showing him, you know what? I've never had that problem. Well, I did at first, but I, I, the Lord broke me of that. You know, and because I, I was very particular in the way that I like things done. You know what I mean? And it had to, you know what I mean? It didn't mean, like, they didn't have to do it exactly like I did, but it, the outcome better have looked the same. You know what I mean? It better have been mirror on. So I had to learn to take a step back and just say, hey, you know what? Do what you do. Get it done. Let me see you do it and do it. You know what I mean? And, 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 I, and I would show them. You know what I mean? And it came to a point, you know what I mean? I, I would tell people, you know what? I'm going to show you everything that I know. Why? So that way you can be better than me. And that was the whole thing. I want people to be better than me. You know, just like here in the church, I want you guys to be better than me. I want you guys to succeed more than me. You know what? I want what's best for you. And I know sometimes it may be hard to see. But perhaps... We need to trust in the Lord a little bit more. Well, folks, we can't trick God. We could pull the wool over Christ's eyes, or can we? We can't because he sees everything. So we truly have to follow what the Bible instructs us to do. We have to try and to live up to the expectations that God has set before us, right? We have to. We have to try and live up to the expectations that God has set before us. Does that mean that we're always going to meet them? No. The Bible says that we all fall short of the glory of God. You know what? It's an expectation. It's not a demand. You know what? He's not demanding us to do. Because if he was demanding us to do these things that he commanded us, you know, that he asked us to do, most of us would be going to a place that we wouldn't want to go. But he expects us to do these things. And so John 15, 7 says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. But he said something important there. Remain in me. Go with me to John, 1 John chapter 3, verses 21 through 22. So we could tie this all in together. He says, and beloved, if our, conscious, if our consciences, our hearts do not accuse us, if they do not make us feel guilty and condemn us, we have confidence, complete assurance and boldness before God. And we receive from him whatever we ask because we watchfully obey his orders, observe his suggestions and injunctions, follow his plan for us and habitually practice what is pleasing to him. How many of you guys were a habitual offender? Just me? Oh, okay, two of us, three of us. Praise God for habitual offenders. <laughs> ah, serious. Praise God. Why? Because you know how to do things repeatedly. <laughs> yes. But see, praise God that he changed us from the world. I want you to understand that. God was showing us something, you know what? And that's character. Just because it was out there in, in the bad, you know what? Now it's transformed into the good because God has changed us, you know what? And it's good because habitually out there, we knew how to do the things that we wanted to do. But now that we're saved habitually, we're going to begin practicing doing the things that God wants us to do. So from now on, call me a habitual Christian offender. I'm good at that. <laughs> I went over it in there. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Now go with me to verses. We're going to read verses. We're going to keep going all the way to 24. 
He says, and this is his order, his command, his injunction that we should believe in, put our faith and trust in and adhere to and rely on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And that we should love one another just as he has commanded us. All who keep his commandments, who obey his orders and follow his plan, live and continue to live, to stay and abide in him. And he in them, they let Christ be a home to them. And they are the home of Christ. And by this we know and understand and have the proof that he really lives and makes his home in us by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. So here again we see that we must be following God's commands and try to live what is considered a holy life. Remember that we are supposed to love the Lord with all our heart, with all our soul and mind. And we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. How many of you love your neighbors? Praise God. You know what? I'm getting to know my neighbors, but I really don't love them. I'm going to be honest with you. Because I don't know them. How can I love somebody that I don't know? And guess what? Whose fault is that? Mine. Why? Because I remember when we first moved into the home. I remember neighbors came and said we had been praying. They didn't even know us. They said we had been praying for you guys to get this house. And I said, wow. They would come and, you know, introduce themselves, invite us over. You know, our neighbors right across the street, they do a movie night every once in a while with the kids when their grandkids are over and they'll put up the big old pool screen, you know what I mean, out there in the driveway and they'll invite the whole neighborhood like a block party. Come and watch a movie with us and have popcorn and, 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 and drinks. and Not like drinks like that, but like, cool, you know, drinks, you know, refreshments, beverages. You know, and... and a lot of times we don't go. Why? Because we don't feel comfortable or we don't fit in or we don't know somebody. Well, how are you going to know somebody if you don't go in and feel comfortable? Remember when you were a kid and you wanted to play with somebody's toy? You didn't ask. You didn't even ask who the toy belonged to. You just went and grabbed it. Started playing with it. And the other guy, ah, it's mine. Give it back. I'm telling my mom. Well, how about us? You know what? I got to go and I got to go learn to love my neighbors. Go knock on their door and, hey, you know what? You might not like enchiladas, but I have a whole bunch of enchiladas left over. You want some? Yeah. You know, and maybe they'll tell you, get off my porch. I hate your guts. God bless you. Love you. And you keep going. You just love them. You know what I mean? Praise God. You know, we also have to give thanks at the same time. Go with me to Philippians 4, 6. Giving thanks. A lot of us, we don't know how to give thanks. We sing the songs. We go through the motions. He says, do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. How many of us are guilty of this? I'm guilty of this. I'm going to tell you right now. Church, I, sometimes I'll, go, I'll have like a big project that's going to come up. And I'll be thinking about all kinds of stuff. Well, I need this. I need that. I need this. And I'm all worried and have anxiety. And he tells us, you know what? Don't worry about it. Don't be worried about anything. Nothing. And he says, but in every circumstance and in everything, by what? Prayer and petition, definite request with thanksgiving, continue to make your wants known to God. Continue to make your wants known to God. You know, thanking God ahead of time is like showing confidence that he will hear your prayer and answer them. How many of us, how many of us are thanking God in advance? For our children, amen, being saved. You know, for our loved ones being saved, for them coming in to the, to the church, you know what I mean? Wherever, wherever they go, I don't care. No se importa de mí, as long as they start serving God. Amen. That's all I care about. You know, but giving thanks for everything. Amen. Man, we got to get in that habit. See, church, it's easy to praise God when everything is going good. It's easy to praise God when everything is going good. But how about when life stinks? When your life is no fun, when you're suffering, you still have to give thanks to God. Amen. And honestly, can't we always find something to praise God for? Can't we? Imagine, man, I go to hospitals sometimes. You get to 
pray with individuals who are on their deathbed. But usually the room's full of family members or whatnot that are all up. And then you go in there and you talk to the individual, you know what I mean? And the only thing, he has a whole bunch of positive things on him. He's thankful. Sometimes, not all of them, but, but some of them that I've ran into. Man, the Lord's taking me home. Praise God. Keep my family out there in the hallway. Why? Because they're negative. <laughs> go anoint them in the name of Jesus, man. Don't they understand where I'm going? See, a lot of times, you know what I mean? And I had this experience, too, with, with our grandfather. Well, my wife's grandfather. He was my, calling my grandfather, too, because we had a very close relationship. But him the same way. You know what? He couldn't go in peace because he was too busy holding on to his, to, to, to his last breath because he was worried about all the family members bickering and fighting and fussing about everything instead of being joyous. You know, and we had a chance to, to, to lead him to the Lord. And I want you to understand that he was a Catholic. He was a devout Catholic. Didn't go to church, but he was a Catholic. Had his funeral in the Catholic church. But before he passed away, we got to lead him to the Lord. And he gave his life to Christ. And that was the thing that he wanted his kids. He said, you know what? He goes, I don't want nobody to be sad. I, don't want, I want you guys to remember all the good things that I did. He goes, don't think about that. I'm going, you know what? And, 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 and well, that's what we got to do. We can't think about all that stuff. We got to think about the good stuff. You know, and I say, yes. I say, yes, there is always something to be grateful for man i had to start the lord had to start dealing with me in this too as well like at work you know what i mean because sometimes things are just materials come in and they're all messed up and they don't work the way that they're supposed to and you know what i mean and, and you have to make decisions and you could get mad and you can throw material halfway across the thing and kick it or whatever you know what i mean if you want to and get mad or you could just start being thankful and saying hey you know what they ain't the only vendor in town. I know somebody else that sells that same material right down the street, and it's probably brand new. So thank you, Jesus. The job's going to get done anyways. I'm going to go pick it up. Amen. Instead of being all negative about everything. You know, this is why we can say things like, and maybe you have heard these things before. And they always come at a time when you don't want to hear them. How many of you, when you're going through something and somebody comes up to you and says, give all your cares to God? That's not what you wanted to hear right there. You wanted somebody to come hug you and pat you on the back. You didn't want somebody to tell you, oh, all you got to do is give all your cares to God, brother. Let go and let God. That's a famous one. I don't know how to let go, man. I'm used to hanging on. And then somebody tells you that, well, you don't understand. <laughs> you know what stop worrying and start praying stop worrying and start praying you want to know something really cool today God never commands us to worry about anything he never commands us to worry about anything see the cool thing is that he promises us over and over again that he will look after those who follow him and keep his commands He's going to look after those who follow him and keep his commands no matter what. Church, we must be watching for answers. Go with me to Colossians 4.2. You know, we pray and we don't watch for the answers. He says, be earnest and unwearied and steadfast in your prayer life, being both alert and intent in your praying with thanksgiving. Alert. I want you to pay attention to that. Sometimes we're praying for something and then we just give up. But God already gave us the answer. We just weren't paying attention. You know, a lot of times, we're, man, God has already given us the answer, but we're not paying attention. And we're like, God, how come you don't hear me, God? And this, I don't see you. And, and he's already given us the answer. We pass by a billboard, amen. Somebody comes up to us and, and tells us something, but we're not paying attention, church. You know, he warns us here in this scripture, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Don't miss the answer because you gave up looking for it. Don't miss that answer because you gave up looking for it. Man, yesterday I lost my bracelet. Man, I about flipped my wig. Because I knew where I put it. Yes, I did. 
I knew exactly where I put it, right next to all my other jewelry. I put it right there, and I'm like, now somebody took it. And then right away, you know what I mean? I, you know, we're the only ones in the house. I'm not implementing my wife or my kids, you know what I mean? I said, check the cameras. Somebody came into the house and took my bracelet. She's like, like, we're going to take your bracelet. <laughs> and I'm not, you know, I wasn't even blaming her. I said, nah, no, nah, it wasn't even like that. But you know what? The thing is, I had a call. I had a call, man. I was looking all over. I was, man, I was losing my marbles. And don't ask me, you know what I mean? But I, I kept looking. We were flipping beds over, going through the whole house, searching everything. Went back a hundred times to the same spot that we looked in, knowing that it wasn't there, but we looked again anyways. And I called my daughter, and I was like, where? I seen it on the floor up there. I tore the whole room apart. No, it ain't. Where'd you see it at? On the floor by the heater. It was inside the heater. We would have never found it. <laughs> it would have been in there forever. It would have melted or something in there. But it was inside the heater. But we didn't give up. See how many of us, we give up on stuff right away? Because nah, we don't get an answer right away. And we're not looking. And we're not being watchful. You know, see church, it's like John and Peter and Mary Magdalene. How many of you remember when they go to the tomb where Jesus was laid? You know, the two of them, they left. But she stays. You know, and the thing is, is while she didn't give up, she stayed and was watchful for the answer. And she was rewarded by seeing Christ Jesus. She stood at that tomb and she waited. She goes, you know what? I'm waiting. I'm waiting to see. And everybody else left and went into the upper room and didn't get to see until after. But guess what? She was there and she got to see before everybody. And she got to go back and tell everybody, I seen Jesus. He's alive. He is risen. Yeah. But guess what? They didn't wait. They were up in the, in the upper room. And what did they think? Oh, you're lying. You didn't see Jesus. You know how many of you that people tell you that? Oh, you're not saved. Oh, you're not this. You're not that. Why? Because they like to look at all your flaws instead of all the good. That's that classic scripture right there. He goes, why do you, with a plank in your own eye, try to take the splinter out of your brother's eye? And I like the thing because it says plank and then it says splinter. Yes. Minute little things. Instead of thanking God for all the good that he's doing. You know, another thing we must be mindful about is that we must seek spiritual things first. You know, go with me to Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. It's important for us in prayer. We got to seek spiritual things first. 633. He says, but seek, aim at, and strive after first of all his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right. And then all these things to, taken together will be given you besides. You know, the question is, what are you seeking in life? And what are you really devoted to? What are you devoted to? You know, some of us are devoted to our employment. Right? Because if we don't go to work, then we can't pay bills. But I want you to be careful in your devotion. Yes, you have to go to work. But you know what? Be devoted to God. Why? Because God gave you that job. You know what? God blessed you with that. So you know what? That's the things that you need to focus on. And a lot of times we're focused on the, the advancement. We're, we're focused on, you know what I mean, the, the, the raise or all that other stuff, you know what I mean, or the, or the title. Instead of just thanking God for having a job. You know, when you begin thanking God for the place that he puts you in, then the advancement will come. Amen. Then the title will come. But you know, we have to learn to be thankful right there first in what God has given us. You know, if we are seeking our own will... And if we are asking for our own will to be done, nothing good is going to come out of that. Nothing. Nothing good will ever come out of that, church. You know, I want to I show you something here today. And, and we're going we're gonna to pray a, a quick little video before I finish off my message. Amen. Let's, let's, let's go to this video real quick. The scriptures teach that as Christians, we've been crucified with Christ, and therefore, our lives are not our own. In fact, we live in this life by faith, 
And sometimes that faith is severely tested. There's a hymn called, It Is Well With My Soul. It was written by a man named Horatio Spafford. He was a wealthy lawyer from Chicago. And in 1870, he lost his only son to scarlet fever. A year later, the great Chicago fire broke out and wiped out nearly all of his real estate assets. Then a couple of years later, the economy took a dive and he was even more affected financially. In order to help boost the family spirits, he sent his wife and four daughters overseas to attend a rally by D.L. Moody. At the last minute, he wasn't able to go because of some business concerns, and so he sent them, and he said, I'll meet up with you shortly. Well, halfway across the Atlantic Ocean, their boat was struck by another vessel, and it sunk to the bottom of the ocean. When Horatio Spafford's wife, Anna, got to a place where she could telegram him about the incident, her message only had two words, saved alone. His four daughters drowned in the accident. He was obviously devastated, and as he boarded a ship to sail across the ocean to meet up with his grieving wife, he spent many hours on the bow of that ship, looking over the edge at the waters that had claimed the life of his four precious daughters. And when he got to about the spot where they perished, he penned these words, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. That's really the same message that Peter gives us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19. He reminds us that sometimes we're going to suffer according to the will of God. But when we do, we're supposed to entrust our souls to a faithful creator. If our faith is strong enough to do that, we'll be able to say, like Horatio Spafford did, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. When peace like a river and a death my way when sorrows like sea billows roll and what is
that with the death of his daughters and the very same place where they drowned to the bottom of the ocean but he said all is well with my soul he still glorified God you know he could have gave up on life right there he could have gave up on everything man how many of us you know what I mean things happen to us in our lives you know what I mean and, and we give up we're so easy to give up you know, we get offended or something happens, we want to give up, you know what I mean? And, and the thing is, you know, we, we may give up on people, but guess what? In the end, we're giving up on God. Why? Because those are God's people. Those are God's people. You know what? We can, we can, we can get up and leave and go anywhere that we want to go. Why? That's selfishness, church. Selfishness. See, and there's a lot of Christians who are accustomed to doing this. You know, they get up and they go and they just go, you know, instead of just saying, you know what? All is well with my soul in good times and bad times, no matter what. I'm going to continue to glorify God in everything. Man, we have to understand that the life that God has called us to as Christians is not our own. You know what? We don't live for ourselves anymore, church, but we live for a greater cause. You know, we must pray for, our, for fellowship with other Christians. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. We've got to pray for other Christians. He says, pray at all times, on every occasion and every season in the Spirit, with all manner of prayer and entreaty to that end. Keep alert and watch with strong purpose and perseverance, interceding in behalf of who? A-L-L. Of Al? Oh, no. All. Who all the saints, God's consecrated people. How many of us just pray for people that we see? Pray for our church family, you know what I mean? We pray for our friends or whatever. But he said right here, he goes that we are to intercede in behalf of all the saints around the world, churches in California, churches in Zimbabwe, I don't know, wherever they're at. But we are to call to pray for those other Christians, those consecrated people. You know what, Lord, help them. I don't even know who they are. I don't know their name. I don't know where they're at. I don't even know what they're doing. But I pray that everything they do glorifies you, Lord God, and you provide their every need. You know, we have a whole bunch to pray for, but we don't know how to pray. Man, I don't know. Everything's going good in my life. Is it really? Because I don't know about you. It's kind of hard. It seems like nothing really ever goes good in my life. No matter how hard I try. You know, it could have a little sugar-coated candy on the top, but you know what? Life is difficult. It is hard. It is rough. You know, the Bible is clear, and it instructs us to be in prayer for all of God's church. And this makes sense, right? After all, we're just one body united for Christ. 
So why is there so much separation in the church? Why? Because there's not prayer. You understood that, Siri. Amen. I just had to put her in her place real quick. Sorry. Amen. But that's why. You know what? Churches don't want to be united because they don't have prayer. You know, and when you're associated to prayer and the Holy Ghost, churches don't want to be associated with you. Why? Because churches are moving away from prayer and the Holy Ghost. And I want to tell you right now, Pentecostal churches are moving away from prayer and the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you right now, the AGs, the assemblies of God. You know, right now, you know, I mean, they're telling you that you have to have you have to have a degree in order to have, you know, I mean, in order to have a a a a, a, a pastoral license. You know, I never I never read in the Bible anywhere that an education got you a pastoral license. You know, what I read is that the Holy Spirit. God will choose somebody, not because of your education, not because of your stature, not because of your appearance. He picks the lowly things in life. You know, he's going to take somebody, amen, that's rough around the edges or whatever, and he's going to empower him. It's going to be the Holy Spirit, and it's through prayer. Why? Because people have been praying for him. You know what? You're not here because, you know what, you just showed up here. Every single one of you are here because somebody has been praying for you. You know, somewhere down the lines. And somebody's still praying for you. And you wonder why you're going through things in life. Why? Because people are praying for you because they love you. And they're interceding on your behalf. And you don't even know it. They could be up the street. They could be at the healing place. Amen. They could be at Fearless. They could be in a Methodist church. They could be in a Catholic church. You know what? Catholics pray better than Christians. I'm telling you right now, I went through a whole rosary service, which was prayer, not to the right person, but it was prayer, and they all prayed for an hour without hesitation. You didn't even have to ask them to repeat or say anything. They just went right along with it. Now, you ask a Christian to pray or come to a prayer service, chale. What is it, on Friday? I ain't going. Sunday night? No way. I got to get ready for work. You know what? You just better stop it with all that mumbo jumbo. And you better get your butt to prayer. I don't care how early you got to go to work. I don't care how late you got to work. I don't care what you got going on the next day. Put God first. You want your days to go better at work? You want your days to go better, you know what I mean? And whatever you're doing, put God first. Come and pray. You want your family members to start sitting next to you in these seats? Guess what? Come to prayer nights. You can come to church all you want to, but guess what? Nothing's going to happen until you start coming to prayer nights. You know what? Let me not say that. Let me not say come into prayer nights. You know what? I would love for you to come to prayer nights. But you know, first of all, I want you to build a relationship with the Lord and build a prayer closet wherever you're at. Whether it's in your work, whether it's at home, no matter where, you know what? Learn to pray to God. And when you learn to pray to God, then you know what? It won't be no problem. Sometimes I know we got things going on and we can't make it, but make it a habit. To always gather with the saints and to pray for the Christian body. Amen. Amen. So that way it could be unified. Man, the Lord needs to help us. Go with me to Jude chapter 1 verse 20. You know, another reason why our prayers aren't answered because they're selfish. You know, he says, no, that's not it, right here. He says, but you, beloved, build yourselves up, founded on your most holy faith. Make progress. Rise like an edifice higher and higher praying in the holy spirit you know our prayers are to reflect god's will they can't be selfish also we must have no hard feelings towards anyone go with me to mark chapter 11 verse 25 how many of you right now are harboring hard feelings Yee, man some of you were mad at your spouse this morning and ain't even asked them to forgive and then you want to come to church and pray. And he says, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him and let it drop. Leave it. Let it go in order that your father who is in heaven may also forgive you your own trespasses or failings and shortcomings and let them drop. 
Nah, well, I have to forgive. Yeah, you got to forgive or what? He ain't going to forgive you. And guess what? If you're not forgiven, he ain't hearing you. Ooh, man. And if you ain't forgiven, he ain't hearing you. In order to be forgiven, we must learn to forgive. How many of you have a hard time forgiving? Mm. Praise God. God's been dealing with me in this. And I've been learning how to forgive. And the outcome hasn't been exactly what I've expected it to be. Why? Because I ain't getting the same thing in return. I get hatred back. But I keep going. I said, all right, you know what? This isn't for them. This is for me, Lord. You're teaching me how to forgive. Why? Because now that I've been doing this, I got a smile on my face. Why? Because I dropped it. I let it go. You know, a lot of times well, something will happen and we constantly think about it. That's unforgiveness. Oh, why did this happen? Or why did this go on? Or why did this? Or why did this? Or you know what I mean? Or why did this person leave? Or that or that. Unforgiveness. Just forgive. You know what? It, it doesn't matter. It's their walk. It's their life. You know what? Praise God. You know what? I know what God's doing in my life. I'm going to continue praying. I'm going to continue forgiving. And I'm going to continue moving forward with God. No matter what. Why? Because I want him to forgive me. This has nothing to do with another individual forgiving me. I could care less if they forgive me or not. They can hate me for the rest of their life if they want to. But you know what? I want God to forgive me so that way he can answer my prayers. So I choose to forgive. Amen. I choose to forgive. Amen. Amen. Man. But rather because when we didn't deserve forgiveness, God granted it to us. Now we are asked to forgive the unforgivable. Man, think about it. Man, God did it for us all. He died for us on the cross of Calvary. You know what I mean? That's, that's the least that we could do. Is forgive people. You know what, man? God has given us everything, man. He's given us eternal life. He's given us a hope and a future. You know, everything. He wants to heal us. He wants to fill us with love and, you know, give us the, the better things in the spiritual realm. But we have to learn how to forgive. You know, also, we must have no hard feelings toward anyone. Go to Mark. Yeah, right there. We're there. No hard feelings toward anyone. Go with me to Matthew 6, 7. Now, this scripture here is a little bit more tricky. I had to do a lot of praying on this one. And he said, and when you pray, do not heap up phrases, multiple words, repeating the same ones over and over as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their much speaking. Repetitious in prayer, you know what I mean? Like praying the same thing over and over and over and over again. And I was like, that's, that was my train of thought for a while. And I was like, well, God don't want me to do that. And I was like, no, let me, let me pray and let me pray in this. Because, you know, and I don't think that's what God's trying to say here. You know, and I want you to understand that God doesn't want you to go on in prayer to him. He doesn't want you to go, you know, he doesn't want you to go to him in prayer, but he wants you to go to him all the time, constantly. And he wants us to pray without stopping. You know, I mean, without stopping. And what here, he's, he's implementing something here. And see, what we have to do is we have to realize that this was written for, for, for you know, the religious folks. You know, he wants us to live a lifestyle of prayer to be in constant communication with him. But let me explain the context of this verse. During Jesus' days here on earth, the religious leaders loved attention. They would stand out on the corners and pray, and they did it so well. They were polished, and they used words and big words to impress people. And this is what Jesus said about that. Go with me. to. We're going to read verses 5 through 8 in its entirety. He says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by people. He goes, truly I tell you, they have their reward in full already. He goes, but when you pray, go into your most private room and closing the door, pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you in the open. 
And when you pray, do not heap up phrases, multiple words, repeating the same ones over and over as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their much speaking. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. You know, you don't have to come up with all kinds of fancy words. Be yourself when you come into prayer. That's right. Man, Lord. Yes. You know, maybe you're just coming to the Lord. You know, you're not that far along in your walk. Man. I don't know how to do this, Lord. What's up, man? I'm just sitting here, Lord. Are you really real, Lord? I don't hear you, Lord. But I'm praying, Lord. And then you keep praying that same thing over and over and over again. But are you paying attention? See, in repetition, what happens is we don't pay attention. It's one thing to be re repetitious in prayer, but you've got to pay attention. While you're praying in repetition, make sure that you're looking for God to give you an answer on, on what he has for you. You know, go with me to Matthew 6, 14. This is key right here. You have to choose to forgive. For if, you're forgive, if you forgive people their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, leaving them, letting them go, and giving up resentment, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But you got to let it go. How many of you want God to hear you? How many of you got want, God, want God to answer your prayers? Amen. How many of you want God to, to bring your family in? Amen. How many of you want God to change your circumstances? How many of you need healing in your life? Man. You know what? I need to learn to forgive. Forgiveness, you know what I mean? It's bitterness, man. It, it's like poison. It's like cancer that goes throughout the whole spirit and the body. And it causes major, major defects in our health. Yes. And we have to learn to forgive. You know, go with me to James chapter 4, verse 3. Yes. See, when you ask with the wrong motives, we will not receive. That's right. That's right. See, or you, or you do ask for... God for them and yet fail to receive because you ask with wrong purpose and evil selfish motives your intention is when you get what you desire to spend it in sensual pleasure how many of us ask for a lot of those things oh Lord I need uh, I need this I need a house or I need a car or I need a I need a new job or I need this or I need that what was the scripture that we just read before that he already knows what you need so we're supposed to pray, be praying according to God's will, not according to our own selfish wills and desires. You know what, Lord? If it's your will and it's your desire to deliver, you know what I mean, my, my family member from drug addiction or alcoholism, Lord, I, I pray that, that you would do so. Don't do it because I want them to be changed. See, a lot of us, we want people to be changed. That's a wrong motive. How many of us, we want, that, that's, that's us putting ourselves in the position of God. Why? Because a lack of prayer, a lack of understanding. We don't, we don't, we're not God. That's right. That's yeah, we want people to, yeah, we want people to come to the Lord, but you know what? Our prayer life can't be selfish. It can't be because that's what we want. No, Lord, it has to be because of what you want. Let your will be done. Let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. If it's your will to send them to jail, send them to jail. If it's your will for him to lose his job, lose his house, lose his wife, his kids, that's your plan. That's not for me to get in the way. But what I'm supposed to be praying about is that you open up his, his eyes, Lord. That you soften his heart, Lord. That you conform him. That you're changing him. That your will be done. That you save him. My job is to love him. My job is to forgive him. My job is to pray for them. Not according to my will, but his will. You know, which creates a problem for us, doesn't it? Because this is what we've been taught, and this is all we know. That's how we pray, right? That's how we pray. Because then when a prayer goes by unanswered, we have, the quest we have to question our motives. Are we praying for God's will or our own? Now, my wife is a perfect example to this. She was ready to give me divorce papers. Had them in her hands and everything, handing it to me. I wouldn't take them. I said, crazy. Signing those stupid papers to death to his part, woman. <laughs> but no, straight up, right there, she had to change her motives. You know what? She was praying that God would change me according to her will. And what she would do is she would go looking for me. 
She'd go knocking on doors. She'd go calling police. Like she took on the role of God. You know, how to be there at all places and all times. How many know that God's everywhere at all times? She ain't got to be there. God's already there. He knows what's up. That I'm doing what I ain't supposed to be doing. Huh? She didn't have to waste her energy and time going and look for me. All she had to do was pray that God's will would be done. And that's what she did. She said, you know what? I can't do this anymore. And she had to let God be God. And she said, you know what? I'm willing to lose you. Here you go. Because I'm going to serve God. Here's the divorce papers. You do what you need to do. But I'm going to serve God. And man, then God got a hold of me. Why? Because she started praying according to God's will. How many know when you pray according to God's will, man, God is going to answer those prayers, man. So we really need to reevaluate. You know what I mean? When we're looking at our prayer life, I want you to think about this. The things that we've been praying for. We need to reevaluate those things because are they what we want or is that what God wants? You know what? We may want a big church, but that may not be God's will for us. You know what? We may want a packed house, but that may not be God's will for us. What is God's will for us? I know that he's called us to be a praying church. You know, first and foremost, he's called us to be a praying church, amen. to be an outreach church, to go out and to evangelize, amen, to hit the streets, amen, to do what nobody else is doing. You know, they might be doing a few things in here every once in a while, but God has called us to do something different, you know, and we got to pray according to God's will. And once we start beginning to do that, man, the floodgates of heaven are going to break on open and we're just going to be able to see what God's going to do. You know, another thing is that we must not doubt because God will keep his word. Go with me to Matthew chapter 11, verses 23 through 24. And we're getting close here, church. We're going to come up to this altar and we're going to pray here today. And he says, and you, Capernaum, are you to be lifted up to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades, the region of the dead. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Saddam... He goes, it would have continued until today. But I tell you, it shall be more endurable for the land of Saddam on your Matthew. Go to Mark. I said Matthew, didn't I? Sorry. I just said, I, you know, I took the blame for it. Praise God. That's humbleness. Amen. Truly, I tell you. See, before I would have said it was her fault. I said, I said it's my fault. You know, truly I tell you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt at all in his heart, but believes that what he says will take place, it will be done for him. Ooh, next verse. For this reason, I'm telling you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe, trust and be confident that it is granted to you and you will get it. Mm. Man, you. Do you think it's God's will to save your loved ones? It is. Why? Because he died for the sins of the world. That's praying according to God's will. You know what, Lord? You died for my loved ones. You died for my family members. You died for my children. You died for my auntie, my uncle, whoever, Lord. And I'm just thanking you right now, Lord, that they're coming into the church house. I thank you that they're coming into the fold right now in the name of Jesus. Not, I hope they come. I hope they do. No, I know that they're going to come. The confidence, he says, by telling that mountain, be removed and not to, you know, doubt at all. But to have that, it's happening, it's done, it's finished. In the name of Jesus, like he said, it is finished. It is done. You know, it's done. But you can't waver in that. You got to keep going with the Lord, knowing that it's finished, that it's done. And if you have been paying attention... You have noticed that the word forgiveness keeps on popping up in a lot of these scriptures that I just read. That's right. That's right. You know, and this thing goes hand in hand. Yes. You can't have a prayer life if you don't have forgiveness. That's right. That's right. You can't have a relationship with the Holy Spirit if you don't have forgiveness. That's right. Amen. You cannot serve the Lord if you do not have forgiveness. You know, I was talking to my spiritual father last night. And he began to cry. Because we began talking about the church. And how the church wants to change. 
You know, you see it all over the place. You know what? I, I told the man, I was like, I go, all these big churches, you know what I mean? In, in, in all these places, I go, you know what? I go, they don't have prayer and they don't have, they don't talk about the Holy Spirit and all this stuff. I was like, I go, I go, but they love God. He said, no, 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 no. He said, they don't love God. He said, because if they loved God, they would serve God. You know, there's a lot of people out there that say they love God. But they don't serve God. You know what? They get up in their feelings or whatever, and they do whatever they do. They have unforgiveness and all kinds of stuff in their heart. And they say that they love God and that they're going to keep on serving God. They don't love God. Because if they loved God, they would serve God. You know what? And when you serve God, you serve God in good times and in bad times. When it's easy and when it's hard. When it's favorable, when it's unfavorable. When you feel good, when you don't feel good. You serve God. That, that's, that's, what, that's what a love for God is. And that's right. That's right. You know, when you're offended, you forgive. Yes. When you're hurt, you let God heal you. And you learn to keep on going with the Lord. I want to close with John, 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 through 15 this morning. And he says, and this is the confidence, the assurance, the privilege of boldness which we have in him. We are sure that if we ask anything, if we make any request according to his will, in agreement with his own plan, he listens to and hears us. And if sincere, we positively know that he listens to us in whatever we ask, we also know with settled and absolute knowledge that we have granted us as our present possessions the request made of him. Amen. Anything. Amen. The request made of him, he has granted it to us, church. Amen. Stand with me here today. Go ahead and put on some music, honey. How many of you guys need your prayers to be answered? You know, there's a lot of unforgiveness. There's a lot of praying for selfish needs. But I pray today, I pray that that would all change. Father, right now, in your mighty name, Lord Jesus, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord, that your will is going to be done, Lord, on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you, Lord, that today, Lord God, that you are here with us, Lord God. And that as we seek your face, Lord God, as we begin to pray, Lord God, that if we pray according to your will, Lord God, that you hear and that you answer our prayers, Lord God. Lord, that if we don't harbor unforgiveness in our heart, Lord God, but that if we harbor forgiveness in there, Lord God, that you, Lord Heavenly Father, forgive us as well, our trespasses, Lord. You know, Lord, right now, Lord, we've had family members, Lord God, that have been praying for us, Lord God. We've had spouses, Lord God, and children and friends, Lord God, who have been praying for us, Lord God, strangers that have been praying for us, Lord God. And right now, Lord God, I just pray that your will would be done, Lord God, in those prayers, Lord. Let those prayers, Lord God, come to life, Lord God, in our lives, Lord God. Let them be manifested, Lord God, through the fruits of the Spirit, Lord God. Let your Holy Spirit move in and through our lives to lead us into all truth, to give us discernment and spiritual knowledge of what you are trying to show us, Lord. 
Lord, let us always be attentive, Lord God. Let us always be aware, Lord God, paying attention, Lord God, that as we pray, Lord God, that you already have given us the answer, Lord God, but we got to be on the lookout for it, Lord God. Let us never grow tired and let us never get weary, Lord God, but let us always, Lord God, come to you, Lord God, in prayer, Lord God. Let us come before you, Lord God, pouring out our hearts unto you, Lord God, allowing you, Lord God, to heal and mend. Father, we thank you. And I pray that you would just bless your people here today. I pray, Lord God, as we make our way down to this altar, Lord God, that you would give us the words to speak, Lord God, and that we would lay it all down right here today in Jesus' mighty name. I want to invite you to the altar, church.